Never underestimate your own resilience and resourcefulness and ability to overcome the odds when you follow your passion. Um, I think it's, it's, it's really, really important. Always, always keep the passion close to your heart. Um, how you want the consumer to feel about your brand, the impression you want to leave in the mind of your consumer. But the best brands not only do that, but they also think about how they want the consumer and the audience to feel about themselves when they interact with your brand and their ability to achieve their potential or their dreams. That's the difference between good brands and great brands. Hi, this is Greg Hoffman, author of Emotion by Design, and you're listening to Dreams in Drive. Hey, Dream Drivers, welcome to episode 316. I am super excited for you all to hear from today's guest, Greg Hoffman. Greg is a global brand leader, advisor, speaker, and former Nike chief marketing officer. For over two decades, he was a major strategic and creative influence for Nike at every major global sporting event for the launches of Nike signature products and innovations and for the building of the brands of its athletes. We're also going to be diving into Greg's book, Emotion by Design which is a celebration of creativity and a call to action for brand builders to rediscover the human element in forming consumer brands. What I also love about this conversation with Greg is we dive into his personal journey, which is I always think is the most fascinating, right? Greg talks about what it was like to grow up as a mixed race child with adopted white parents, his early love for athletics and art, and how he started out as Nike as an intern actually and built his way up from there. Greg dives into the difference between a good brand versus a great brand, which is something that we as dream drivers need to understand. And he also dives into what it's like to embrace this thing that he calls the creative gauntlet, the importance of legacy, and what he thinks the best storytelling investment is that you should be making in yourself and your brand. If you enjoy this episode, I'm going to ask that you're sharing it with your community. You can find us across the board, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So make sure you're following us. We are Dreams and Drive on all those channels. Post this to your Instagram stories. Let other people know that you really do enjoy these Dreams and Drive episodes. And if you want to join our email newsletter, The Keys, and get weekly updates via email, just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash join. All right, let's hear from Greg. Hello, hello, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Yes, I am super excited for our listeners to be able to chat with you, right? I think that we're going to learn a lot about your your life, your time as a creative, and what you're doing in the brand design, emotionally emotional storytelling space, and what our dream drivers can learn from that. But you know, as always, I think we cannot think about where we are unless we really reflect on where we've been, right? So I want to I want you to take it back to Minnesota, right? Is that where you grew up? In Minnesota, that, that is correct. Yes. All right. Uh, let's let's go back in time, right? Um, who was the seven-year-old Greg? Like, what was inspiring you as a child? Uh, great question. Because I agree. You know, the origin story is important to understand where some of this came from. This drive, right? And uh, you know, as a as a seven-year-old kid, I was I had two passions. I was obsessed with art and sport. And in some ways, they were escapes for me because I was a bit of an outsider there in the middle of America. I was a mixed race kid. I was half black, half white. I was adopted into a white family. I went to an all white uh, school system. So oftentimes I was looking at things from the outside and observing things. And what sport and art allowed me to do um, is fuel my passions Um, give me a sense of identity. And I really discovered early on that I could dream something and then draw it in vivid Mm. detail, right? And it was uh, quite empowering for me um, to discover that talent and also have parents that really invested in that talent. And so that's where I was in terms of, of kind of drawing every day. And then sport actually allowed me to feel Um, not only that I was a part of a a team, but also understanding the creativity within team dynamics, you know, and that started at an early age. And so alongside with that, of course, I had lots of questions about my own Black identity, right? Because I wasn't necessarily living that experience, not in a positive way, right? 
Maybe yeah. some of the negative things that go with that being the only one in the room. And well, so you really um, like the only one, like, you know how sometimes there might be like one other or two other. More often than not, the only one, right? So you're, yeah. you're going to kind of uh, both at home and in, in, in school. And so that's where I turn to, uh, you know, the, the, black icons of sports, right? Like Pele or Muhammad Ali or Michael Jordan um, and seeing what they were doing uh, in the world of sport. And quite frankly, some of them um, like Muhammad Ali outside of sport in terms of how he exercised his voice. And then just to keep it going, um, as a kid, here's this brand called Nike that started to put these athletes in their advertising, started telling stories um, including people of color, which quite frankly, in the early and mid 80s, wasn't something that happened, right? And so that's where I started to get this emotional attachment to this brand. I had no idea they were located out in Oregon, right? <laughs> I only knew them as the brand um, that had the logo of the swoosh and just do it as their slogan, but even within that brand mark and that tagline, there's so much emotion infused in it. And everything that was coming out of that brand um, communicated, communicated something in a deeper way that really kind of motivated you to get out there and do great things. And so that's kind of that, that early life, um, those, those sparks, if you will, that um, really were responsible for leading me to where I am today. Oh, there's so much there. You're talking about art, you're talking about sports, teamwork, um, your identity as a Black, well, a, a, your growing identity, right, as a mixed race, yeah. a mixed race individual, right? Um, so I want to ask you, what sport did you play? I'm just interested because I feel like we would have been cool growing up, right? I was into arts, I was into sports, but my problem was I was never really good at sports, right? But I loved them. I, I yeah. loved track and field. That was my sport. Oh, yeah. Um, but like, you know, I always won like, you know, team captain or a sportsmanship award, but I never really won any medals. <laughs> but what was your sport of choice? Well, we, we do have um, the track and field in common because I was a long jumper and a hurdler, right? Okay. I was a 400 meter hurdles. Okay. I don't know why Not I did easy. it. I was horrible. I was it is, it is probably the toughest race there is. Trust me. I, yeah. I, I did that too, but not by choice. Okay. <laughs> so, so, and along with that, um, I played, uh, you know, the, the sport I excelled at the most was actually soccer and soccer okay. started to become, um, very popular in the eighties, especially by the late eighties. Right. And, um, it um, it serves as the inspiration for so many of the approaches in terms of how I led kind of creative teams because of how the sport of soccer is played uh, on the on the soccer pitch. And um, so um, I had a lot of learnings um, starting at an early age for that. Um, but um, really, you know, I knew that. And I also played basketball, but it was clear by the end of, of high school that, you know what, <laughs> that's not for you. A, a professional career in sport probably wasn't going to happen. Um, I was less inclined to put in the level of practice and more inclined to try to emulate like all the inspirational heroes uh, in sport that were out there, much to the frustration of my coaches. So what was the dream for you then? If you knew like sports wasn't probably going to be your, well, professional sports wasn't going to be your thing. Did you go into higher education thinking, all right, I'll try something else? Or did you always have that Nike at the back of your mind? You, you, well, you're right. It was a bit of a crossroads. And I had no idea that sports and art essentially would come back um, mm. together. And I felt I was having to make a choice, right? And so I went on to design college, the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, uh, where I, I learned and got a degree in graphic design. Um, but in that time, I had to kind of put not my passion for sport, but certainly playing sports on the back burner. And I, I, at that time, still didn't know that you could actually make a living as a creative within the business of sport, right? Because look, so much of 
what it's like to be a high school kid or a college kid is, is there's a mystery in terms of these industries and what those opportunities are. And quite frankly, there's, there's a lot of barriers for access into those opportunities. And so uh, it wasn't until, you know, the end of that senior year in college um, where I discovered that, wow, there's an internship program at this brand that I love named Nike. And there wasn't a lot of information on it, but I did send in my portfolio and um, I ended up getting a phone call um, back when they used to use rot- rotary phones. A little okay. dial. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you, no cell phones, nothing, <laughs> right? I and, was going to um, ask you, how did that work? How do people get internships back in the day, right? It was like, was it, did you learn about it? How did you learn no about email. it? There's no email. So you learn about it by... Things are saying. <laughs> I know. Just, I'm not even. I'm 30, right? So I feel like right. I'm not. You know, I started my the digital revolution started for me probably like in elementary school. Like that's when we got accustomed to email and yeah. stuff. So by sixth grade, everything was online. You could start to you know get everything. That's right. So and people can do the math. I I left. I graduated college and went to Nike in 1992. So okay, okay. I won't. I won't say my age. <laughs> people can. And yeah. it, so so think about it. So yes, you're. Putting your portfolio in the mail. You're then waiting weeks and then hearing back through the mail. And again, it's by chance. Like, what if it gets lost? And then you just happen to be in your college apartment when the phone call comes and um, says, you got the internship, but here's the deal. You just have to be here on this specific date. Otherwise, it goes to someone else. The problem wow. was, the problem was, Raina, as I was like dead broke and I had no transportation and I had to get from Minnesota to Oregon. Uh, Portland, Oregon. And so thankfully, my parents uh, borrowed me their 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 van. They had this van with the airbrush on the side and the ladder <laughs> on the back and the card tables inside. And so that's that's the story. I drove that van out to uh um, Oregon and the internship didn't start until the following Monday. And I got there on the Thursday. And to be honest, I just drove to the location of the internship and slept in the van, um, because I didn't know anybody and I didn't know, you know, I, I, I didn't have necessarily the money to afford, um, an apartment out there. So, you know, the learning there is it's like, you'll net you, you, Never underestimate your own resilience and resourcefulness um, and ability to overcome the odds when you follow your passion. Um, I think it's 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 really, really important. I always, I always keep keep that the passion close to your heart. Um, and you can you can overcome the numerous barriers that everyone faces, um, especially today, you know, with with kind of dealing with the, you know, the coming out of this pandemic and a lot of the other things, I think certainly that college graduates are facing uh, today. Um, So each generation has to overcome different things. But I think um, passion and clear goal setting are extremely important um, when, when finding your path. Do you remember how you felt when you walked through Nike's doors for the first time? And I'm pretty sure it wasn't like the huge campus that it is today, right? But maybe it was. I don't know. Tell me. But what what were what were your feelings, if you can remember, what that was like? Well, it was incredible because the first half of the campus opened that year. And to come to this uh, campus and to see these buildings that are named after you know, these incredible athletes like Michael Jordan, right? Um, and and so, and then that the fitness center was called the Bo Jackson Fitness Center. Mm. And Bo Jackson was really that first two-sport athlete who could play baseball and football. And um, I really uh, took so much inspiration from him um, while I was in high school and college. So now it's like, Wow, you you not only walk into this place, but um, you get to work out in the house that Bo Jackson built, if you will. And that kind of came became my home away from home because I had always been into training um, and um, alongside sport, and that was something that was a daily habit for me. And uh, it was also something where 
I could not only while I was working out, I could also ideate and think about ideas as well. So it was kind of my time to escape and and brainstorm about um, what was uh, in front of me. What skill sets do you think you were coming in as an intern, right? Like in your bag, you had like, I, Greg, I'm like 22, however old you were at this at this point, right? I have these skill sets and I'm ready to show these people I'm going to rock it here. Like, what was that for you? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, that summer was the first time, again, I'm going <laughs> to date myself, but that summer was the first time Nike got Macintosh Apple computers, okay? So the good news was I showed up and... I had just, I knew how to use them. No one in the office knew how to use them. And so here's this kid shows up. Um, He's kind of quiet, kind of shy. He's not talking to too many people, but he just jumps into the, onto the computer and he's able to generate these designs um, immediately. And so I made myself useful that way by being able to visualize and create the artwork on the computer. Um, And um, it was really an accelerator um, for me in my career because it um, oftentimes when you're doing an internship, it's pretty hard to find your way. Um, And um, it's also sometimes hard for a manager or a coach to figure out how to utilize you. So I was able to make myself pretty useful because I, I always think, you know, what's, what's the one thing it's good to have competency in a variety of different skills and 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 um, tasks but what are you fluent in when you go into the workforce right what is it that you have a deep level of knowledge of and how can you make that clear to your employers and your teammates and then as you're kind of exercising that fluency in that particular craft how can you level up those other areas Mm. in in the time being how did you level up? Because, you know, 27 years later, right, you you left Nike as the, you know, chief CMO. Right. So it's just let's I guess there's a long story there. But right. Yeah. Take us through like what do you think were some of the biggest game changers and you really advancing along this Nike journey? Well, I, I think early on uh, the the kind of the creative pursuit and the process of design is pretty personal. It's like creating great art. And oftentimes you're in your own head and you're obsessed with what you're creating and you're maybe not seeing the bigger picture, the bigger role that you could play within the company and within the role of the consumers that buy the products, as well as your role in the world. And um, it really, um, the big unlock for me which kind of moved me from just being an individual contributor, right, to starting to lead teams and bigger and bigger teams was that um, I could practice the art within brand building um, while also being an advocate for the consumer and a, a steward for the brand, right? That meant I had to pull up a bit and go, well, wait a minute. Like, yes, I can create these amazing stories um, or or experiences, but at the same time, I can also start to take on this this platform of speaking on behalf of the brand and what the brand needs and what the brand needs to mean to people. And at the same time, have a deeper empathy for the individuals, your audience, that has to um, work with these products and services and feel these stories. And so that was the transition kind of moving from, you know, being, um, you know, all about me, right. And my work, um, maybe even territorial at some times mm. and kind of breaking free of that and really starting to, um, first and foremost, represent the brand, um, uh, versus myself represent the consumer, versus myself, and then use the work. And the work started getting stronger and more powerful. Um, And that gets back to that idea of emotion by design, that there's an intention that you're trying to create stories um, that kind of deeply resonate with people and make them feel empowered and that they can accomplish things, right? It's not about us, because I think here's... Here's something for your listeners, you know, um, 
oftentimes branding and, and the art of brand management is about um, how you want the consumer to feel about your brand, the impression you want to leave in the mind of your consumer. But the best brands not only do that, but they also think about how they want the consumer and the audience to feel about themselves when they interact with your brand and their ability to achieve their potential or their dreams. That's the difference between good brands and great brands. And once I started to make that transition, I started taking on more and more responsibility, right? Because now you're, you're, you're taking, you're, 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 you're moving beyond projects and initiatives. And now you're, you're creating, you're sparking movements. You know, you're, you're serving as a catalyst um, for, for your team, for the brand and for, for the audience you serve. Dream drivers, what's up? It's summer and I know we all are on the quest for the perfect beverage to quench our desire for refreshing. So here's the question. What have you always wanted to try? Is there something that has been a dream of yours, a flavor, a taste that you just really need to get at? Gold Peak Real Brewed is here to unleash your thirst for trying. Real brewed tea, real cane sugar, real delicious. From sweet tea unsweetened tea, green tea, California raspberry tea, Georgia peach tea, lemon tea, lemonade tea. There are so many options to find what's best for you. And this summer, we need to try something new, try something brewed, because nobody wants to be dream driving with a dry mouth or thirsty. We need that fuel to be at our best for this ride. So take this as your sign to say yes, opt in, go for it. Because trying is what life is all about. Try Gold Peak. Hey, Dream Drivers, you know I'm all about adventure and dream driving, so I want to let you know about family-friendly fun you need. This summer, Disneyland Resort invites you to celebrate soulfully at the happiest place on Earth. Here are my picks of what you definitely want to check out. From June 1st to July 4th, you can enjoy Celebrate Soulfully offerings that coincide with Black Music Month. Disney California Adventure Park is offering live music. Celebrating the sounds of doo-wop and Motown in downtown Disney District has the soul of jazz and American Adventure, a touring exhibit that illustrates the legacy and dynamic history of jazz. Y'all know I'm a foodie, so something I check out in downtown Disney District is the Creole cuisine at Ralph Brennan's Jazz Kitchen. And if you're not into that, discover new faves from Black-owned food trucks. There are so many ways to feed every part of your soul throughout Disneyland Resort this summer. Theme park admission and park reservations are required for park entry. Visit Disneyland.com for more details. Dream Drivers, Hennessy celebrates those who never stop and never settle in their never-ending pursuit of greatness. Maurice Ashley lives his passion. Through his love of chess, he made history in 1999 as the world's first black grandmaster. An inspiring story of intellect and brilliance, his ability to push the potential of his own mind to new levels of greatness is universally inspiring. Visit Hennessy.com to learn more about Maurice Ashley. In the world of the mind, there are no limits. Hennessy, never stop, never settle. Now, there's so many points that you brought up. And um, I was going to say, I think that's something that sometimes consumers, well, creators, I should say, sometimes we we get stuck in how does this make me feel, right? Or we put ourselves and we don't put our consumers at the center. Um, And with Emotion by Design, I know something that you often talk about is the idea of playing in the intersections as well, right? And why do you think that's also an important part when it comes to how you approach your brand design? Well, I think, you know, again, um, when you're creating uh, stories, uh, when you're trying to create something that's um, truly going to break new ground, truly going to surprise the industry, your competitors, um, and take your audience someplace new, um, I think you know, the key to that lies in the intersection where you're crossing paths with um, other great thinkers, uh, introducing new technology, um, even collaborating with other brands or ambassadors. And you get this these great um, juxtapositions um, when, when you do that. And so I think um, not all innovation can just come from within you know, um, so often the best breakthroughs in innovation come outside of your industry 
And I'll use this as an example. You know, you think of Nike Air. We take it for granted now, but it may be um, not only Nike's greatest innovation, but one of the greatest innovations ever in footwear. And the people fact who don't is, know what that is, can you just tell us? People who don't well, know what that yeah, is. Yeah, Ni- Nike Air is you know the airbags that um, were were conceived um, that helped with cushioning inside of you know footwear cushioning up until that point um, was pretty much the same across the industry. And here comes Nike, and they introduced Nike Air. You're literally running on air, airbags within your outsoles. And the thing is, is, you know, the the roots of that innovation came from space exploration. It came from NASA. Wow. There really? was a Yeah, there was a NASA engineer who was creating uh, ideas around astronaut helmets. Wow. And he came to Nike with the idea of Nike Air. And here's my point. The whole point is curiosity is so important to to um, great leadership and creating great business opportunities. And the fact that Nike at that time was not only open, but understand the need to to look for ideas and meet with people and see new things outside of itself and then bring those in to the brand. That's that idea of intersecting with other people, other places, and other products. So I have a little question here for you because there might be somebody listening who's like, hey, Greg, I'm being innovative. I'm bringing, you know, I'm playing in the intersections. I have this unique spin or idea, but you know what? Nobody cares. And I've been working on it for three years and I think it's the coolest thing or I think it's so innovative, but no one's listening to me, right? They're kind of having their Kanye moment back in the beginning, right? When nobody gave him a chance. What would you say to that person who's really sitting on what they think to be this unique trend or this unique approach to what they're building, but they don't get any traction? Well, I would say two things. One is, as I say, you need to embrace the creative gauntlet, okay? Yes, you need to fight for your product and fight for your innovation, but you have to have invited diverse uh, eyes and, 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 and voices into the process so that there's a discourse and a rigor to how effective this innovation really is. If you've just brought it to this moment and it's really just been you or others like you that, quite frankly, aren't going to kind of deliver the hard truths that we all need in the creative process. So first and foremost, embrace the creative gauntlet, meaning fight with conviction, but you must have certain individuals around you that are making the work stronger. Second, secondly, when you're selling that innovation to prospective investors, you know, um, have you truly painted a picture of the end in mind of this audacious future that this product is supposed to achieve and deliver? And is it um, is it vivid and and exciting and and meaningful? Um, and I think, you know, sometimes, um, a, an entrepreneur or, or, you know, a founder, um, is focused on, um, you know, either the technology or the, the, um, you know, they're not, are you focusing on what it is or what it does or what it will lead to? I think it's, it's really important and start with the most aspirational vision, Right. And then work back from that. And so I think that's that that's really important. Sometimes what you're communicating is, you know, well, I don't need to know how the food is created. You know, I need to know how the food tastes and what it's going to how it's going to make me feel. Right. And how it's going to um, empower me on my journey in terms of what I'm trying to accomplish. So that, those are just a couple things. Make sure that um, the vision that you paint um, to pull people into your idea um, is, is back to this idea of emotion design is stirring the right emotions, right? Ooh, um, I think right. is important. No, I, love, I love that you mentioned that. Um, I want to go back to your time at Nike just for a little bit. Um, as you were rising the ranks, right, you know, 
getting those promotions within at any point did you think I want to try something else or maybe this isn't for me I, I'm just wondering right like did you ever have aspirations to leave and do other things or did you really feel like hey I can really grow here well uh, yeah I mean I um I would say the idea that as what I would say a, a right brain thinker right because you know back then it's like oftentimes if you're someone who's who's a bit on the creative side, right brain thinker, you see things in a nonlinear way, oftentimes there may not be a place for you in a traditional corporate structure. I like to say, you know, embrace the daydreamers is is something, you know, the right brain thinkers, right? Um, And um, so oftentimes they don't necessarily neatly fit into a structure, but here was Nike. And the fact that, creativity and invention um, and defying convention and not being um, not, not accepting the status quo. Those were the values of the brand already. Yeah. So why was I there that long? Because I found a home where I didn't have to be something that I wasn't. Oh, wow. So I'm going to, I want to finger snap there. That's so important. you must lead an authentic life. And it's really difficult often, right? Um, because at the end of the day, um, in the world of business, it is work and you have an obligation <laughs> to grow the business. But how can you do that um, in a way that's, um, you, know, uh, you know, playing to your strengths, allowing you to be yourself, bring some of yourself to work, Right. And, um, and this was a place I could do that. And I was also allowed to, to fail, to succeed. You know, it's funny. There's, um, when people ask, well, what's your favorite ad of all time? And, um, Nike ad, right. And, and I have one and I didn't work on this one. I worked on, you know, many ads, but there's one in particular to emphasize this idea of success from failure. And it's the Michael Jordan 9,000 shots ad. And what's amazing is as Michael was going for his sixth championship, you know, a, a creative director from Wyden and Kennedy, a writer uh, from Wyden and Kennedy sat down with them and realized that Michael over his career had missed 9,000 shots. And over his career, he had been past the ball with time running out to take the game owning shot. And he had missed it 28 times. And so they created this story and Michael's doing the voiceover saying that he's missed 9,000 shots. He's missed 28 game winners, but because of this and because of failure, that's why he succeeds. And we can all relate to that. It's putting yourself in position, right. And to, to take the shot. And even if you, are you in a, in an environment, in a culture that allows you every now and then to miss the shot because they realize that part of innovation, part of of that idea of dreaming of better futures um, comes with um, uh, risk, you know, that not everything is going to make it. And there's a lot of uh, work that's going to end up on the cutting room floor, but that's, that's the price of innovation. And so, that's that's why I, I've worked there that long. And I, I I would probably assume brands like Apple and others that are known for their innovations, you know, have a similar culture. What were some challenges you experienced along your career journey that you think really shaped you? Well, again, it, I had to find my voice as, as someone who's more of an introvert um, and um, you're in a pretty competitive business environment. And that the early part of my career, so much of it was about um, speaking through through the work and the designs, right? And it took me a while to figure out, like, okay, based on what I'm comfortable with as, you know, early on, more of someone who's observing, wanting to take the information back, sort it out, and then come back with the answer. Um, over time, I got more and more comfortable Um, with articulating a point of view in real time, but doing it in a way that felt um, uh, natural to me. So, because I think that's important too. 
And I think, you know, now more than ever, um, it's important to understand that, you know, just because you're the loudest voice in the room doesn't mean you're right. And so, <laughs> so, so I think it's, it's been great to see just this pr- progression of corporate culture um, that there's, there's room now for far more voices at the table um, and um, far more um, diverse perspectives and experiences. And people are realizing that this isn't just the right thing to do. This is great business um, because, I, as I said before, um, and, and I like to say that this is, a, this is what I say all the time, is diversity is the oxygen that breathes life into the pursuit of innovation, right? Because you have different people that have lived different lives and experienced different things coming together, and it's that diversity that leads to untapped and uncovered opportunities, right? Because if everybody's the same in the room, yeah. then you're just simply not going to look at your peripheral vision is going to be quite narrow. Yeah, so it's kind of like it's on a sport analogy, right? If everybody is, if everybody is like the point guard, then do you really have a team, right? <laughs> it's like you need everyone to play a role to have that different experience coming onto the court. So that you can have that best outcome, right? One hundred percent. Yeah. So it's and so I I, I love the uh, more work to do, but I really do like the trajectory of of greater diverse representation uh, in the room, in particular within the um, disciplines of advertising and marketing and design innovation. Um, with that said, it's just the beginning. There's far more work to do, but I think um, there's far more awareness uh, to to this this arena. So, one last question before we dive into your book a little bit, um, and this is just my you know personal. I'm just wondering, how do you feel like your time at Nike also helped you find your identity or how you identify as like a mixed race, right? You know, and you mentioned earlier that you're half black, but you grew up in a purely white environment, right? Do you feel like your time at Nike, you were able to find and connect more with this like part of yourself that you may not have had, you may not have gotten to explore in its fullest yet? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and and uh, on, on all levels um, and uh, ultimately becoming uh, an advisor for marketing to design in the Nike Black Employee Network. And I was a reluctant leader at the at the time over the years, often, right? Because you're not sure um, how much your perspective counts in those environments, right? Because you didn't necessarily grow up um, within the same culture and experience. And what you start to realize, though, is that no, you need to use your platform and your position to help, you know, lift. Um, others that are unseen or unheard. And so it was really through my work with, you know, the Black Employee Network at Nike that I really started to see how you could lead beyond just the business at hand, how you could not only um, help, uh, you know, empower um, others, uh, but also start to introduce themes of equity and equality and racial justice into the actual work that we started to express out through our storytelling and communication. And so um, it was, as you would say, you know, fertile ground to really start to, um, you know, connect more um, to that side of myself and also play a leadership role within that. And not to jump ahead, but to come but I will because it relates to the point. But to, as I wrote this book, um, to get to April of 2021 and get a notification through 23andMe from someone that says I'm their uncle. And within one hour, I realize it's my sister. And- Wait, your sister thought you were her uncle? That's correct. Okay. And- 
then fast forward to a wave of relationships and and uh, information and questions answered by unlocking uh, those the the discovery of both birth families and going very very deep into my African American heritage all the way back before the Civil War, right? And um, realizing that um, a lot of the passions for, for art come from both sides of the family, as well as this passion for driving social impact, in particular um, through underserved communities of color, you know, deeply rooted in this, the, the, my black heritage. And so this all happened as I wrote this book and I wasn't planning on that, of course, but it's that's been, how life is sometimes, right? That's right. But it is, it has been an absolute, uh, just, um, life bonus that has no price. Um, uh, because when you grow up and you're, you, you, you know, you take it for granted, but you're not sure why you look the way you do or sound the way you do or why you have certain characteristics or passions. And then one day within a couple of months, you've, you've answered all these things. Yeah, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been quite, uh, quite profound. Hey, Dream Drivers. So you know how I start every show asking guests the same question. What inspired you as a child? What were your childhood dreams? I remember as a kid, a place I always wanted to visit was Disneyland. Why? It represented a place of dreams, a place of wonder, a place where imagination and creativity were put on a pedestal. It was just a happy place full of magic. Well, guess what? Disney can still be the place where you go to fulfill some of your childhood dreams. This summer, Disneyland Resort invites you to the happiest place on earth. And yes, you can bring the family too. There's just so many things and so many types of dreams you can put in motion. Let me give you a taste. On select days at Disneyland Park, you can rediscover and celebrate Simba's journey from Timid Cub to Mighty King with Tale of the Lion King, a live stage show inspired by the Lion King. It's narrated by the storytellers of the Pride Lands. Simba's rise to royalty is presented in a unique theatrical style inspired by the cultural roots of this timeless story. Now, if food is your thing, nearby, enjoy a special menu inspired by Tale of the Lion King with items including the chicken coconut curry sweet potato or Pride Rock Punch. If you're into music, through September 5th at Downtown Disney District, visit the Soul of Jazz and American Adventure, a touring exhibit that illustrates the legacy and dynamic history of jazz. There are so many ways to feed every part of your soul and reactivate that inner child in you throughout the Disneyland Resort, making this summer the perfect time to visit. Remember, though, theme park admission and park reservations are required for park entry. Make sure to visit Disneyland.com for more details. Think to yourself, what childhood dream can I make come true this summer at Disneyland Resort? Isn't it there's that, there, there's that whole idea of like nature versus nurture, right? Like, of course, there are cert- certain things that your adopted family that you inherited from your growing up. But there also like are things like deep within us that, you know, come from our genes and our, you know, it, it's That's so right. amazing. Like to know that you've always had this type of, you know, artistic inclination that ran in your blood, literally, right? Well, imagine you get this notification through 23andMe and it's, you, I graduated college with a graphic design degree and I look and see this person that's like graphic designer and I graduated from this particular high school and I look and they graduated from that high school. I'm like, okay, this is like, wow. So you might have even crossed, it's, it's even weird, like you could have crossed paths with like, you know, and you <laughs> so, didn't even know. Well, but. and that my birth mom lives nine minutes um, from my adoptive family. So it's just interesting how you can live a whole life, you know, literally in the peripheral of all these connections. And as much as I go on and on about how the art is being squeezed out of marketing and brand building, and it's really being so led by data and analytics, and, and so much of it is being automated. Well, I greatly benefited from that through the 23 and right. That's, that's right. So who am I to kind of rail against uh, the, the, the power? I just think it's amazing when technology and data kind of basically 
power, stronger, more human connections. I think that's that's when it's at its best. Um, and and it's really when you're able to move beyond transactional relationships and they really become human relationships between a brand and its audience is is what I strive to help brands do. I love that you mentioned that. And this ties into the whole idea of like emotion and design and marketing, especially if you're trying to build something. So my big issue right now in the world of brand building has been like audience acquisition, right? And really growing the follower base. And I always wonder on social media, I don't know how much you did like work with social media in your work, but there's this reels now, like everything's either, everyone's trying to be TikTok, but I kind of feel like in closing everything to like 15, 30 seconds, you lose so much essence of like that storytelling ability and yeah. everything is truncated now to being, what's the shortest, quickest, funniest viral way we can make something pop, right? And so I feel like is the only way that I can grow going to be figuring out some kind of funny thing to do on TikTok. And I'm just like, that's not me, right? So I've kind of been anti-TikTok, but I'm like, am I missing out? So it's interesting because one day I'm like, you know, I have a son. My son's 18 months. I'm like, I'm just going to post a video. I have a, a montage of him playing with my my father, right? To me, it was just something that I did. I'm like, you know, my dad said he wasn't going to spoil his son, his grandson, but look at them now. I posted it just hands-free, wasn't thinking about the impact. Right. But yeah. that was the most watched video on my Instagram page to date, right? And mm -hmm. people were commenting about how it made them feel. Um, right. You know, I was able to say like, oh, now I'm doing this, right? And it's just so interesting sometimes at the end of the day, emotion will win, right? Of That's course, right. like funny and all that stuff will get you the followers, but people st still want to see that things that hit the heart and for me, it's like, maybe I don't have to go that ha 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 funny route. I can find a way to connect with people by like being myself. And I've always liked these type of like feel good. Sure. Let's think about the heart of the story. Like why, like, like you said, like, why is that stuff still so important when we're thinking about marketing or thinking about brand design? Well, you know, I, I have this saying, don't chase cool. And I actually <laughs> have a, a whole chapter, right? Because yeah. if you chase cool, um, you're not going to catch it. And quite frankly, your audience will know you're faking. And I like to say that authenticity is your cultural currency. And chasing the latest trend will bring short-term success. It will bring the most likes. You will grow your followership. It's just, it's so hard. If it's not authentic to who you are, it's really difficult to sustain it, mm. right? And so it's really, really important that you always go back. Here's what I tell any, any brand, small or large. You first and foremost must have a brand plan or a brand house, a, a one-page document. It clearly states, you know, what your belief is, you know, why you exist in the world. What is your mission and vision? Where are you going and how are you getting there? What are your values? Like, what are the characteristics and traits that compose um, your brand. And then finally, who do you serve? Like who's your consumer? And being able to get that on one page and making sure that anyone in your company, even whether it's two people or 2000, is super clear on that, is incredibly empowering and important. And it just, it just helps to act as a gauge and a North Star when you're faced with these questions of, how deep should I jump in to creating short form content, right? And, and if I do, what unique insight am I going to bring to the table so I'm not like everybody else? And what is it going to say about me that reinforces my values? And what I'm not suggesting is that you don't stay up on trends, that you're not aware of what's happening in the world, because as a marketer, you, you must um, be, be on the front line or even in front of it. At the same time, you must always try to connect, um, you know, what you want to say with what you are. Um, and, um, and, and with no apologies on that. So it is a balance, of course, it is a balance. 
um, as branding is a balance of art and science, right? But um, I always say it's like, you need to go back and make sure your own house is in order and that you've clearly articulated the building blocks of your brand house. It's just going to make it easier. And quite frankly, oftentimes it's the decisions you decide, you know, it's what you say no to that has a more profound effect on your personal brand or the brand you work for than what you say yes to. I love that. Um, And then one point that you talk about in your book is this idea of leaving a legacy and not just a memory. And of course, we all want to be remembered, right? Like, and when we think about memory, like, I want them to remember me by this. But why is that notion of legacy really the important thing that we should be thinking about? Yeah, it's a great point. And there's a couple things to unpack there. You know, number one, um, oftentimes, you know, memory is like you're, you're, you're there in the moment but you're gone the next day. So again, you, you made people feel in the moment, but you weren't necessarily thinking about the whole journey. I think a legacy is when you're on this kind of journey of progression and transformation with those around you, whether they're in your family or they're in the audience that you serve as a brand, that you're not just selling products. Um, you're, you're, you're on their pursuit of being the best version of themselves and everything that you're doing is, is uh, designed intentionally back to emotion by design um, to, to propel them to get closer to what they want to accomplish. And I think that's where you start to become a legacy brand, right? So that's one part. The second part is how can you use your platform um, and position as an individual and as a brand um, to, to unlock opportunity and access for those that, you know, don't have it. You know, there's, there's great inequity in the world. And I don't think indifference is an option. Even if you're a brand, you have the opportunity to, to leave a legacy as a brand that's not only created incredible business growth, right, and brand strength, um, but you've you've um, you know really lifted up um, the life experience of those that um, have less than others, those that don't have privilege, those that um, um, oftentimes face incredible barriers, um, and that can be across a multitude of areas. It's just at the end of the day, you need to ensure. Basically, it comes down to to this. How can you um, connect what you sell as a brand Mm -hmm. with with what the world needs at a given time on a particular cause? And how can you close that distance? And again, it has to be done in a way that's authentic to who you are, your belief and why you exist and the promise you've made to your audience. And within that, are there ways that you can serve the world in a way where we all have a better future. Thank you for that. Um, You know, the thing that I was thinking about as you were speaking was this idea then, like, what's the best investment then that you can make in your brand? Like, is it hiring someone like a Greg Hoffman to come in and show you the way, right? Or is it like, if, if you could direct someone who's, let's say, in the first five years of building their brand, right? Best investment you can make in storytelling. Well, I, I think oh, you marketing. Do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Marketing. Sure, sure. Well, that that is why, you know, obviously I I uh, this is a call to action, this book. It's a call to arms to make sure that you're investing in your creative practice within your brand. Again, whether it's a small business or a, or a global brand, because we're at a point where because of the this this digital arena that the relationships with brands and consumers live within right now, um, things are getting a bit automated. And sometimes it's hard to know that there's a person behind that brand, right? When you're getting all those emails or ads through your feed, you know, and you want to feel that there's a human being, um, you know, that, that you're interacting with. And so um, that's why I, I, this is timely that I'm trying to deliver this message now to show and not just say it, but showcase it through stories and lessons, 
so people can see what happens when you invest in creative individuals, teams, and a creative culture, it will unlock the ability to not only resonate in a deeper way with meaning in people's lives, but change the world at the same time. And I also think this conversation has made me realize there is a space for you, right? And I'm saying you like that creative who doesn't yet know like what their spot is. Think about you, right? You always love art and sports as a kid. You didn't know that you would, I'm pretty sure at seven years old, you didn't know that you would go on to become the C, a CMO at Nike, right? So for someone who's listening in right now, and who's like, I don't know if there's a spot for me. I can't find my perfect fit yet. Whether you create it yourself or whether you find this team where you really can be yourself. I just want people to remember that like there is space for that intersection of creativity and whatever your other part is like for you, it was art and sports, right? That's you were right. able to find your spot. I just think this is just a reminder that it's possible. And I even think about myself, like I love interviewing, right? I love talking to people. I love conversations. And for a long time, I'm like, what can I do with this? Right? Like I was always called like the, you know, chatty Kathy growing up. Right. But look, now I have a podcast. I have a platform where I'm, I'm able to use that skill in a way that can help others. So there's always a space for you, whatever that little you, whatever that is for you. Right. You're, you're exactly right. And, and it should be noted too, that, you know, I look at creativity in two ways. You know, one is about conceiving an idea and one is the application of the idea. And of course, with the application of the idea, it takes a lot of fluency and expertise built up over time. And, and it's for those that have practiced that, right? Mm -hmm. But when it comes to conceiving and ideating and brainstorming, we're all creative within that context. And that's important to remember. You know, we all have a role to play in working together to use our imag imagination and think of, of, of the future with that imagination. And so in that context, we all have creative capacity. And so I think it's important to, deep, even though I started this conversation by saying that I drew every day, you know, but creativity isn't about being able to draw. That's an old definition, right? So creativity in the one sense is about being able to use your imagination and dream, right? And having the space and the platform to do that. And when you get to do that with a collective and a group of people, man, you, you, can, you can move mountains. Yep, you can. Um, let's end this off by talking about our, you know, our dreams and drive toolkit. You know, in order to be a dream driver, you have to have your keys to success. So, Greg, can you tell our dream drivers three things that they need in their toolkit before they hit the road? Well, I would, I would say, again, it gets back to those three traits, their traits, you know, empathy, this, uh, this ability to see what others see, but find what others don't. So mm -hmm. always, always get past assumptions and observations and ask questions to get under the surface to find out the real needs of an individual or a group of people or even a city, right? So empathy one, curiosity. So if empathy allows you to find that sharp insight or truth, curiosity allows you to find the inspiration. So you can reveal that story in unique and interesting and inspiring ways. And so that's why I say, you know, um, exercise your curiosity, get outside yourself, make plans for figuring out who you can talk to, what you can see, what products you can test, because it will fuel your ability to generate ideas. And then the final is just this idea of courage or fearlessness, right? And I like to say I have a chapter called Never Play It Safe, uh, Play to Win. And that is that whole idea of, of asking the question, what if? or saying why not, and not being satisfied with the status quo, right? And again, not all the time, but just making sure that you have that risk-taking mentality every now and then that allows you to dream big. 
I love that. Empathy, curiosity, and courage. Tell our dream drivers where they can find out more about you, buy your book. I know that it's, by the time this episode goes live, the book will be, so it's, it's available starting tomorrow, right? The 5th? That's right, yes. So by the time this goes live, it's already going to be out there. So you can speak as if like it's out there for sale now. Yes. Yeah, so you can find out more about me on LinkedIn, of course. Uh, you can follow me on my Instagram account, ghoff70. That's G-H-O-F-F-70. And I also have an Emotion by Design Instagram account. It's just at Emotion by Design. You can also follow uh, two different websites. My advisory firm, themodernarena.com, shows what I'm doing in that space. And then the book site, which has uh, an email sign up to get more information on this approach and methodology. And that's emotionbydesign.co. So I'm always up for engaging and uh, having conversations about the power of creativity in business. So it it would be a pleasure. Well, thank you so much, Greg. This has been an amazing conversation. As I said before, you're going to enjoy this, right? And did you enjoy it? 100%. 100%. <laughs> I love your, your loved your energy and questions and thoughtfulness. So it's, it's uh, my honor for sure. All right. So that's a wrap for episode 316 with Greg Hoffman. I hope you enjoyed hearing his dream driving journey as well as his keys to success. Guys, if you enjoyed this episode, you know what to do. Please make sure that you're sharing this episode with your community. You can find us across the board on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Dreams and Drive. So go ahead, post it to your social media So go ahead and post it to your social media channels and let people know that you are loving, loving, loving this episode and that you really enjoyed hearing Greg share his story as well as his tips for us as dream drivers. If you want to join our online newsletter, The Keys, and get weekly email updates delivered right to your inbox, go to dreamsanddrive.com slash join. That's dreamsanddrive.com slash join. And if you are somebody who has a great story and you think you might be a perfect fit for the show, please, please, please go to dreamsanddrive.com slash pitch. That's dreamsanddrive.com slash pitch to submit your submission. Keep dreaming, keep driving, and we'll chat again in episode 317. Bye, guys.